a glass of water. Great understanding is broad and unhurried. Small understanding is cramped and busy. Chang Tzu. My mother died in a chronic disease hospital in Norwich, Connecticut. Uncas on Thames. It was a sad place with sad people. All the inmates were dying. My mother was there for 10 months and every week I drove down with my wife from Waltham, Massachusetts where I was studying Judaics at Brandeis University, a two and a half hour drive each way to be with her. I suffered greatly watching my mother die. It was my first job as a hospice volunteer and I didn't even know it. 41 years later, I began visiting the dying regularly, although I must admit that over the many years of my life, 73, I have visited many older friends and watched them die. In the end, I guess I have gotten used to it. That's why I became a hospice volunteer. There is something about the dying that is real. No more games are being played. They say it just the way it is and isn't. They, as my mother used to say, call a spade a spade. That's why I like visiting them. I like it more than visiting the living. The living are still playing games. They actually think they are never going to die. Or if they don't think it, they at least live as though they were never going to die. Can you think of anything more ridiculous than that? As the old Yiddish saying goes, Komm ich nicht heint, komm ich morgen. If I don't come today, I'll come tomorrow. And so it is, was, and always will be. Most people live their lives so frivolously that for all intents and purposes, they are not even alive. That's sad, sad indeed. For I, who lost his father, at the early age of 14, my father was 44, realized only too well how precious life is. I live my own life every day with one foot in the grave. That's what our great sages always said to do. Man weiß weder den Tag noch die Stunde, as the German saying goes, one knows neither the day nor the hour. And so I went to visit my mother every weekend for 10 months and watched her die, die a very painful death from cancer of the breast and then of the bones. They took her breast first and then all the lymph nodes under her arm. But it was already too late. It had spread to her back and to her bones. I took her down to Yale Hospital in New Haven for x-ray treatments one entire summer. The net result was that she collapsed in my arms and my wife and I had to pick her up by the hands and feet and throw her up onto her bed. It was the second most tragic event in my life, watching my mother die. The first event, as I have written elsewhere, was the death of my father. And yet, it was a blessing to be able to spend the last 10 months of my mother's life with her. And she also left me a great blessing at the very end of her life, in addition to all the blessings she left me while she was alive. The night before she died, my brother and I were in her room. She was wheezing terribly. All of a sudden, she sat up in bed and said, and I said to her, Ma, is there anything I can get you? She looked at me and said, I'd love a glass of water. I went out of her room. My brother stayed with her and brought back a glass of water. I gave it to her, and she drank it in one long gulp. 
Then she handed the glass back to me, sat there in bed, and a big smile came over her face. I saw her lovely soft brown eyes with their blue rim around them. She smiled once again, then leaned back on her pillow and began to breathe heavily. My brother and I left her room. We just couldn't stay there and watch her die. We were too young. Today I would stay right with her and hold her hand. And that's, but that's today. Yesterday I was a young man and today I am old. In my studies of Jewish mysticism, I came across a significant passage that explained to me my mother's desire to have a glass of water right there at the very end. The Jewish mystics, the throne mystics of the second to the 10th centuries, believed that the soul in its approach to the heavenly gates sees the mansion, the palace of the divine. There at the seventh gate, it is assaulted by onslaughts of water. If the soul says to the guardian angel before the palace gates, what is this water that assaults me? Then the guardian angel beats the soul because the soul has shown that it is still not pure. This water, according to the legend, is a deception. In reality, it is the glistening marble plates on the palace walls that the soul sees. These glistening marble plates are blinding and the soul's reaction is that it is being assaulted by onslaughts of water. My mother arrived at the heavenly gates and saw the marble plates glistening on its palace walls, but she was not deceived into thinking it was an onslaught of water. Instead, she calmly saw what she saw, and in her tranquility, she said, I'd love a glass of water. She took the water into herself calmly and quietly. She let it all go by. She, for her, her soul, was not deceived. It was pure. In that purity, it entered into the palace walls into the glistening marble plates and became one with God. I remember giving my mother a kiss on the forehead just before I left her room. The legend also states that when the soul enters the chamber of the divine, God kisses the soul on the forehead in order to let it know that it has come home and is entirely welcome. On the other hand, as a friend of mine said to me when I told him this story, she could also have just been thirsty. Very good, Diggy.